What is cracking, Hope Nation? It's your friendly neighborhood, Kevin Hines. And this is, yet again, another episode of the Hindsights Podcast. Today's guest is a walking phenom, an individual like all of us with lived experience and the will to help others around the world with her story. And she is fond of sharing stories of others. Paris Scobie is the host of the top 1.5 percent globally ranked podcast live well bipolar if you haven't heard it it is time get on board and get to it she's the host of live well bipolar the author of crooked illness lessons from inside and outside hospital walls and speaker for nami national alliance on mental illness she shares how she went from being a patient struggling from inside the walls of a psychiatric hospital newly diagnosed with bipolar depression to returning to work in the same hospital years later to give back to others. Today, Paris uses her platform to highlight the stories of guests who inspire hope in her day-to-day to to unlock more ways in which we can truly live well by Poland through the power of community. She is a gift to this world and a new friend of mine and a great friend to the Hindsight's podcast. Please welcome to the show the amazing, the one and the only, the incredible, the gifted, Paris Scoby. Paris, glad to have you on the show. How are you doing today? Kevin, thank you so much for having me. I was We were just talking before I hit record about just our, our conversation on when I had you on my podcast and just all the things that have happened in, in these past few months. So I'm just so excited to be here and dive into my story and share the whole journey with you and just get into the ins and outs of what that looks like and you know, more importantly, why I, you know, started the podcast and why I'm here today and really what, what that mission is and how, you know, helpful you've been just in contributing to that as well. So I'm excited to dive into all the details of you today. This is awesome. Let's do it. So Paris, before we dive in, let's take it back to where it all began. Where are you from? What was your upbringing like? Yes. So I am born and raised in Arizona. So Phoenix, Arizona, lived in Scottsdale, Phoenix, around just basically all all my life here and grew up just, you know, had my family, my mom, my dad, and my brother and three sisters. And then I'm the oldest. So five kids. And really what kind of transpired for me where I kind of first got into this whole world of mental health, this conversation, what does it mean? What is mental health? What does it mean to struggle? What does that look like? I really, for me, started to hear conversations about it, of course, like anyone else would from TVs, movies, things like that. Some some of the things in my family history that would come up every now and then that I didn't really understand too much. And it wasn't really something we ever got into or, you know, got to learn too much or talk too much about. But I know the biggest thing for me was really just doing things that I enjoyed the most, which is this right here, conversations, connections, community. And I really love that, but I started to lose sight of that when I, I started to struggle really heavily with my mental health. I started around, around age 12, but around for me, it was like 15 years old is when I really, everything kind of started to go downhill for me. And I know one of the biggest things that I can think of back when I think about that time was going through a sexual assault, not feeling supported, really internalizing a lot of the shame with that. And I did not have the tools or the resources to understand how to move forward or cope in a way that would be conducive for me to moving forward. So what I did is, you know, I, I would go out, I would party, I would try to numb what I was kind of experiencing with alcohol and, you know, bad relationships, choices like that. And you know, it wasn't until I later in my life is when I got my diet. I was first diagnosed with depression, then diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but I've struggled with, yeah, it started, started with the intrusive thoughts, negative self-talk, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, self-harm, body image. And just, I feel like it was all of this stuff wrapped up into one big ball that just kept spiraling down further and further. And I just did not have any awareness into what was really happening. I was just trying to run away from it is really what I was doing for a number of years. How did you feel? Can you break down how you felt your life changed after receiving the diagnosis 
and, and during your hospitalization? What was the uh, impetus to the diagnosis? And then what, how did you feel during the hospitalization? Yeah. So for me, I was first diagnosed with depression at 16 and I wasn't diagnosed with bipolar one disorder until I was 19. And that's when I was hospitalized. So that is when I, and I talk about, I literally get into everything with the details around this in the book. So that's crooked illness lessons from inside and outside hospital walls. I talk about what it was like to be in that hospital, what it was like to come out of that, but I did not have a good experience. I know. And I know a big part of that was I was involuntary. I didn't walk in and, you know, check myself in anywhere. I was taken there, transported to an urgent psychiatric center first, where I spent a couple of days and they took, then they transported me to the hospital. And then I was diagnosed with SMI, bipolar one disorder, court ordered treatment and SMIs, yeah, serious mental illness. And I know I, I really struggled in the hospital because I felt like I was just seeing everyone, you know, in, in such heightened states of crisis. And I remember just feeling almost feeling everyone's emotions and everyone's feelings at the same exact time. So it was very hard for me. I kept remember being told repeatedly, you know, sit down in your chair, just sit down. We're going to, you know, take you transport, whatever's going on. And I just kept hearing people, like people screaming, crying, hearing people next to me saying, you know, I just got my child taken away from me. I don't know what's going on. I'm here. Everyone was just in such a state of heightened uh, crisis, going through chaos. And I know for me, I felt afraid. I felt scared. I felt like I wanted to, I wanted to reach out and, you know, have that relationship, talk with my dad, who was always, you know, is my, one of the closest people that always been in my life. You know, I feel like he's always someone who can help, you know, calm me down and kind of walk me through things when there is no logical explanation. But for me, the hospitalization I know did not, wasn't helpful just because I feel like I left there and I didn't have any tools. I remember asking one of the um, people working in there, they would come, come over and say, okay, it was like a checkbox. Like, did you take your meds today? Yes. Did you go, did you eat today? You know, all these, all these questions. And I feel like I, I was like, what do you know? I've been here for two weeks and it felt like I thought I was there for a year. You completely lose track of time. And that was the first time I've ever been in psychosis. I've ever experienced that before was that one time for that hospitalization. But I know coming out of it, that was the hardest part adjusting to being home. I was very paranoid because of the lack of sleep. I would only get like three to four hours, probably a night if I was lucky. And I just felt like I was, I was, told, okay, you need to go to this clinic. You need to take your medication. You can't say no to things. And I remember there was a medication they put me on in the hospital that I couldn't open my hands. I couldn't walk straight. I couldn't stand up. I could barely breathe. And I remember I said, I didn't want to take, take that medicine. And I remember I was in front of the judge because it was court ordered treatment. You have to go and they'll evaluate you and say, you can leave. And I remember she told me, she said that, I know you refused one of the medications. You're not you basically, you can't do that. And I was just like, I just said whatever I was like, okay, I'll do whatever. I was like, at this point, I will say whatever I need to do. I will do whatever I need to do just so I can go home. Because I'm like, I feel like I'm not able to get the help that I thought you would going into a hospital. That's what I thought, but it wasn't a good experience. I saw a lot of fighting, a lot of violence, a lot of people working there, making fun of other patients and, you know, criticizing other patients. And I remember and I remember sitting there saying everyone in here right now is going through probably one of the ugliest moments in their life. And I can't even imagine someone who's working in this space saying, you know, saying that about someone else when, you know, just imagine what it would be like that to live like that every single day, to live like that every single day where you're having constant reoccurring, whether it's suicidal thoughts, voices that you're hearing living like that every day to, and to, to imagine that. So it, it was very disheartening for me. I feel like it made me lose a lot of hope. So when I came home, I went back to the same lifestyle. I didn't, I didn't feel like I knew, I didn't think, okay, well, maybe I could learn to set boundaries or, you know, look at my relationships, my environments, my habits. I didn't learn any of that. I really was just take this medicine, go to your clinics. That's it. So I was kind of like back again at square one. Yeah. Back at square one. And that's the thing. I mean, 
I'm not sure when you were in psych wards in your life, but I was in psych wards from 2000 to 2019. Um, and really the common theme was if you weren't helping yourself, they weren't helping you. And, and in the first three psych ward stays that were involuntary uh, against my will, um, there was no action plan. There was no get out and do these things to better your brain health. It was just like, get out and good luck. Mm -hmm. And that's the mistake I think we're trying to learn how not to make anymore in, in psychiatric facilities or, or, or units like this, where we actually teach the, 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 the patient, which I don't like to call us patients. I like to just call us mm -hmm. citizens of hope. We're all striving for hope. We're trying to get to that light at the end of the tunnel. We just haven't reached it yet. We haven't walked far enough. So I think that with those citizens of hope, we have to teach them if they don't already know the routine and regimen to better balance their brain health. And there's a science to it. There's a science to the things we can do to change our brains, to change our lives. And it's very well versed and it's, it's, it's very well uh, easily accessed. Um, but, but in those wards that you and I have been in, there was no action plan when you're done. It was just like, Hey, see ya. Hope you do well. Hope you don't come back in here, you know, right. or, 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 or I had one experience where uh, a woman was like, I'm going to see you back in a week. Oh my gosh. And, and, was, and, yeah. yeah and, and, and I was back in a week um, and she called it, but how embarrassing for me and how hurtful that, you know, there was no belief, there was no push, there was no drive and there was no push to like actual care after you get out. Mm -hmm. Paris, um, how long did you feel, did you, how, how long did you spend feeling stuck before you found hope? To, to try to fight to move forward? Yeah, I love that question. And just, I feel like for me, even when I came out, so to give you a breakdown of the timeline, this was when I was 19, hospitalized, got my diagnosis. I went back and I worked at that same hospital right when I graduated from, because I, gra I went back, graduated from school and I had you know job opportunities and I ended up going back at the, working at that same hospital when I was just turned 23. And I'm 28 years old now. I'm about to be 29 in April. So that's kind of, 10 years, 10, 10 year timeline. So hospitalization went back, worked, worked in the hospital. And I feel like even when I was working there, I still wasn't open about my experiences. I really wanted to be, but I remember hearing a lot about, you know, the other people working there were like, Oh, you don't want to share too much about yourself or your experiences. And I never understood it. It never made any sense to me because I was like thinking back to myself and I was thinking back to when I had people come into my homes and do visits and all this kind of stuff. I was like, I feel like it would have helped me a lot if the people I, the case managers I had would have opened up about their own struggles. That would have made me see that, oh, look, they can move forward. So, so can I. But again, I feel like when I finally found hope is when I actually had some friends reach out to me um, who I went to high school with, and they were talking about, they were organizing a conference and they said it was a personal development, this book called think and grow rich. They're like, have you ever read this or heard about this? And I'm like, I don't know what this is. And they're like, we want, if you want to come, you can come to it with us. So I remember going to this and I remember seeing so many people get up on stage and talk about whether it's homelessness, drug addiction, mental health, things that they've struggled with and they've they told their stories and they're saying now, this is what helped me. This is what got me out of that darkness. And I remember feeling very uncomfortable. I felt and a feeling I've never had before. And I feel like that moment was that first moment where that seed was planted for me of there's people that I'm seeing in front of me who are talking about these things. And a lot of it is can be overlapping things that I've had experiences with, but look at what they did with it because my environment at the time I didn't have that. I was around partying a lot of people who really just liked being around me because of this wild personality that I was when, and then I stopped doing those things. I lost those, those people, those friends that I had around me who were like, you're not fun anymore. Cause you don't want to go get drunk every weekend or drink or go out to these clubs or, you know, sleep around. I, I was like, I don't want to do these things because if I continue living the same way I'm living, I'm going to keep getting the same results I've been getting, which is unhappiness, frustration, feeling stressed over all of these emotions that are so overpowering for me. And that moment of hope was sitting in that room at that conference and hearing these stories, because that's when I said, 
I want to get back to the things that I used to do. I used to read. I used to like listening to stories and I used to do things that fueled my body and my mind. And I started doing those again. And I started saying, let me just get a full picture and do a full breakdown of what are my habits? What environments do I spend time in? What are my relationships? What are my problems? What am I constantly stuck on? So I wrote it out so I could see it all. And that was my first step into awareness of, wow, I really can control certain things. I can't go back to the past. I can't alter, you know, the abusive relationships I spent a lot of time in, um, getting into a lot of pain from that. And, you know, a big part of it too, was my relationship with my mom, being able to heal that relationship to, to have what we have today, where remember I, I literally saw her last night and gave her her birthday card. Cause we got to catch up and, and, you know, be together. And she just thanked me. She's like, you always write such nice and thoughtful things. And it's so meaningful, but we really didn't have a, a relationship for a very long time. And that always hurt really, really, really hurt me. So I think for me, the, the biggest moment of hope was being in that room, getting uncomfortable, feeling those feelings that I pushed down for so many years, I would push it away and run away and distract myself. I said, no, I'm going to let myself feel the pain. So I can, and so I can see where it's coming from, where are these things rooted in? So mm. I can make changes to my life and my lifestyle to be able to move forward. You know, maybe not from all of it, but from what's happening in the present day, I can control certain aspects that I told myself I couldn't before. Wow. So clear-minded that you went back and you had these 10 years to prioritize your mental health and prioritize your life and your existence. Incredible. What was the catalyst to, to starting your podcast? Tell us all about it. Yes. Yeah, so I started it four years ago now. So I remember I, it was, it's pretty funny actually. So I remember I was at, <laughs> I was actually uh, at my parents' house and I was walking around and that was, I was the very first episode. I was talking about our relationship between our physical health and our mental health. And you can literally hear rocks in the background. I had, I didn't know what I was doing. I literally found, <laughs> I found an app. I said, I'm going to start, you know, I'm, I did a couple of videos prior, a little bit, you know, talking about my experience with therapy and my diagnosis. But I said, I want to really make this a thing where I'm going to start. I'm not going to be afraid anymore. I said, I don't care, you know, what happens. I'm going to tell, tell the story and I want to share other people's stories. So the catalyst for starting it was getting rid of that fear and that shame that I let live inside of me for so long that I said, I can't share this, or I can't talk about this because I'm going to lose friends. I'm going to be judged. I've had all those things happen already. So I said, what is the, what's the worst that can happen? And I said, I started to think instead about who am I hurting by keeping this inside of me and not sharing it? Who am I taking away from who needs the impact? And that's really what something that I, I talked about with you that you, you continuously teach me is the power our stories hold when we're sitting there and we're thinking, you know, I don't know if this is going to do anything or what is speaking about this going to do for someone you would be amazed by whether it's messages, DMs, emails, texts, people that you know, people that you don't know who said, I never knew that you were diagnosed with bipolar, that you were hospitalized, that you went back and worked at the same hospital. This is helping my daughter. This is helping me. I remember getting an email from this guy who's incredible. He said, I'm, I'm 60 years old. I've never told anyone about my diagnosis and literally you know, finding you and you know, listening to your podcast, reading your book. He, he, he literally called me his hero. And I was like, wow, like I, I never, ever thought of myself that way. All I wanted to do was get rid of that fear, get rid of that shame. So I could start to see more hope. I said, if I can get rid of it for myself, I, I can start with that. I can start with myself. And then I said, you know what? I can bring on other people and continue that continue this story. And that was really the catalyst is I need to get rid of this once and for all, because if I can't talk about it openly, I, I can't ask other people questions about it. And I won't be able to be that resource and be that person that I've, I've always wanted to be for others. Wow. It just, it's incredible to see the growth you've made over these last few years and the, the changes you've experienced and how you're helping people with this podcast is really cool. Um, the title of your podcast is Live Well Bipolar. What does that name mean to you and why is it so important? Yes. So the name, so it's, it's actually funny. Remember I mentioned earlier when I first started my podcast, I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew I had to start. I said, start and 
things evolve over time. Just do it. So I started, I didn't know what to call the podcast. And I said, Oh man, I should have thought you need to name this thing. If you're going to have a podcast, you need to <laughs> name it probably. And I was like, I don't know what to call it. So I was writing my book at the time, crooked illness. So I said, I'll call it crooked illness and that'll be what it's going to be. And maybe if I come back, I'll change it, whatever. So, and then I ended up changing it to master your mental Cu- couple years back and then live well bipolar came about because now the focus of the podcast shifted from, it was all, it it used to be all over overall mental health in general, but really what I love talking about the most is people's stories about bipolar disorder and the lessons that I see in their stories of what has helped you live well. And I said, like live well bipolar. I want to know what has helped you, but also I want to know the, I want to know everything. Don't hold back the ugly parts of your story because that is also part of what has a- allowed you to blossom into the path that you're on to access what wellness means for you. Because it me- for me, what live well bipolar means for me isn't always going to be the same as what it means for you or someone else listening who lives with bipolar as well. So that's really where the name came from is I want to be able to feature more things that work, more things that make a difference because I've spent so long of my life caught up in the things that don't work, the things that suck, the things that are overwhelming. I want to be able to, to have more of those conversations to give hope to other people who feel like I just got this diagnosis. It's the end of the road for me. You know, like, like you said, when you had that person who said, I'll see you back in a week, they don't see hope in you. They don't have hope in you. So I want to be able to instill that people through my story and the conversations of my guests who, and, and you having your story on, I know is, is, has been hugely helpful to myself and others as well. So that's really where the, the name came from. Incredible. What would you say is the driving force behind you deciding to publish your book? I mean, we talked briefly about that, but can you really get into it? Yeah. So the driving force for me is I actually never intended to publish my book or share my story in that way. I remember I was starting the podcast. I didn't know what to call it. I said, I'll call it crooked illness. Cause that was the name of my story. And to me, crooked illness means oftentimes when we're struggling so severely with our mental health, we cannot see the ways in which we are being crooked to our own selves, the ways in which we're being unfair to our own selves, but also to the world around us, the ways in which we're hurting others around us because we're so paralyzed by that pain. That's so excruciating. That's where that name came from. And the book, I was actually able to, to publish my story. I remember with the podcast, I've, I've spent so much time interviewing so many people who've written books and I've read their stories and I've learned about their experiences. And I remember every conversation I would have on the podcast, I'd have someone come on and it started to become this common theme of, they'd ask me, well, tell me more about you. And I would never want to talk about myself. I would always be like, no, no, no. Like the podcast is more about you and your story. And then I finally was like, I was like, yeah, like I'm kind of writing something, but I don't know. And I would always have these excuses of, I don't know how to publish a book. I don't, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't know if I should do that. And it, again, it goes back to our environment. When you get around enough people who see the value in you and your story and your life, and they've done the thing, the thing already that you're, you're trying to do, you're kind of not sure of, I feel like that's really what gave me the, the encouragement and the motivation to make it happen. I remember saying, I don't know how to do any of this. And it was like people connecting me like, Hey, you know, I have this great editor or this cover designer. And it was all those excuses that we have, right. Just flooded away because I do know how to do it now. I do know how to make this happen. And because there was that little voice in me that still was echoing of, I don't, I didn't fully recognize the value in my own story. I kept downplaying it. I kept, you know, doing this thing where it was invalidating my own experiences and my own traumas. And I would do it a lot. And I feel like that the catalyst for publishing my book was again, stepping out of my comfort zone, starting with myself, getting over that fear, getting over that, that fear, that feeling inside of myself of, I can't talk about these things. And then doing it continuously by sharing people's stories and then them turning around and telling me, you need to share your story. Cause I would tell a little bit about it to them. And I would always, I, I would always do that. I'd always be like, no, like, I don't want to talk about it too much, but I feel like when you're, again, it goes back to your environment. When you're around enough people who start to see the value in you and your story and your life, and they push you out of your comfort zone, you end up becoming that person that, that all those people who came before you, you're now one of those people to help, help people on that path. Those people make you a better person and you always want to be better. You want to do better, be better. 
make things better for other people. In your experience, Paris, what misconceptions about bipolar depression would you like to dispel right here on this podcast? Yeah. So the misconceptions I have had is one of the biggest ones I've seen is that people with bipolar can't, I know for me, I think about it is the lies, the, what are the lies that bipolar has told you? And the, one of the biggest ones is that for me, I will never be able to have a loving and fulfilling relationship because I told myself, I'm like, no, one's going to want to stay with me. Cause I've had many relationships where I would open up about my hospitalization, my diagnosis, and it was used against me or, you know, made to, I'm going to tell my family about this, or I'm going to tell everyone about this. And it was very damaging. So I was like, wow, like I'm never going to be able to have this. I'm never going to be able to, you know, to, to have a, a family one day, and I'm never going to be able to have stability in any kind of job career or anything. Cause I've gone through so many, you know, getting fired, quitting different jobs, all stuff like this. I've had so many struggles with it. And I feel like a big misconception often comes from people who don't know a lot about bipolar. They might, they might know things about bipolar from what they see on TV. I remember literally last night, um, talking to someone about this because, one of the topics came up about, you know, Kanye West, or he's so out of control, or he's such a wild card or the bipolar thing. And we're, we often see, you know, people in their worst moments with bipolar disorder. And we always think these people can't do these things. And I've heard it a lot. And one of the biggest, those biggest misconceptions that I wanted to spell is everyone is so unique and has gone through such different experiences and stories and moments that you really need to consider the person instead of just masking it. Everyone with bipolar is put into this box. We're all in this box, exactly the same, you know, we're violent, we're aggressive, we're, you know, dangerous, all of these things that I've heard. And I've heard it from a young age. I remember being very young and I tell the story a little bit in my book, but being at a sleepover and hearing someone say, oh, my uncle is bipolar disorder. And, you know, one time he was chasing, you know, someone around the house with a knife and then he was like happy. And it's, I, that's how those, that's how bipolar is. And I was like, oh, wow, that's how bipolar is. And I remember having a, I had a family member of mine who uh, was, uh, has bipolar disorder. And I remember thinking, this person's not like that. So it just, it just made me, it made me sad and mad at the same time that, these things were just being cast out because I'm like, this is exactly why people who are diagnosed with bipolar disorder do not want to talk about it because then, then I, I've had that. I've seen that a lot on, on the podcast. People will tell me initially they didn't talk about it for a while because they did maybe here or there and they got these reactions back. So that's some of the misconceptions that I want to break down is just because someone has bipolar disorder, it doesn't automatically mean you put them in a bucket of they're dangerous. They're violent. They can't have a successful relationship, career, whatever it is. That's not the case. And that's, that's not true. You're married. You have a wonderful relationship. I have bipolar disorder. I'm married. My wife is amazing. And we, we make it work just like any other couple in the world would. We just have a condition that we have to treat, take care of and manage. Um, very, very important points to make. Can you share Paris, your experience managing triggers that arise or uh, sensitive things that hit you that affect you remind you of of tra traumatic situations traumatic days moments years can you kind of break that down yeah so some of the biggest triggers for me and I, oftentimes too i there's things that i learn continuously like i remember through all the years of doing this work i thought for me going back to therapy doing the work to heal a lot of the, the biggest pain points for me I didn't think that these things would ever resurface. I didn't think certain things would ever come back. I was like, well, I'm, I'm, I have a routine now I'm doing this stuff, but they do come back. And some of those triggers for me actually that came about last year, I was reminded of things, you know, with going through the sexual assault that I didn't expect to trigger me or have an impact on me where, and it's, it's things that I notice in myself. So what that looks like is being, you know, just crying a lot, you know, crying a lot, having crying spells, not being able to eat my diet, being impacted, not being hungry at all, or being, you know, hungry all the time. My sleep, you know, being, I couldn't sleep at all, or I was sleeping way too much. My triggers look like also isolating and not wanting to be around people, you know, people inviting me to things. And I just want to be alone, pushing myself out, pushing myself away, 
And really just for me, a lot of that, that stems around the way I speak to myself, being very negative, being very hard on myself for feeling these things. And really for me, what helps me the most with dealing with these things that, and they're always going to come up. That's something I learned that I, I really didn't think would happen. I said, wow, you know, I went back and I addressed all these, the roots of these traumas and I've gotten to, you know, seeing my behaviors that were damaging, but I didn't think that they could ever resurface where I'd, I'd feel the same feelings again. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I want to give a message to people is you will have moments that surprise you. You will have things come up. And, you know, a, a big thing for me was, you know, how, like the pa recent passing of my grandma going through that. So taking, taking the time off for that and not feeling bad about it, not being hard on myself for it. And again, another trigger too, that I've been dealing with recently was going through some, uh, gut health, stomach issues, having some procedures done for that. And again, again, being very hard on myself. Why is this happening to me? I'm so healthy, all these things. But again, it goes back to my support network that's been incredibly helpful, but my triggers and I, and I want to leave that message too, is everyone's triggers are different. They can be similar kind of things that come up or arise, but there's different things that can be very, um, damaging for people or set people off in ways that won't, you know, maybe it doesn't bother me, but it bothers someone else who has bipolar disorder. So for me, it looks like isolating, crying, diet, changing in my diet, not wanting to be around people and just having those really overpowering thoughts that, you know, so, and then again, even the suicidal thoughts still can resurface no matter how much work you do. So I think it's always important to, to know what those look like. What do my triggers even look like? So that's part of the, part of the process is getting clear on that. I hear that because I, I still struggle with suicidal ideation sometimes and it, it can it can almost uh, plague you, but if you know what to do to defeat it, you can always survive it, and that's that's kind of where I stand on that. Um, Paris, what challenges have you come across in finding the right treatment plan for you, and what advice would you give to others trying to navigate finding the right treatment plan for them? Yeah. I love this question because for me, the struggles that I faced early on, a lot of that was attributed to me not being honest, whether in therapy or my doctor's appointments or things like that, not telling the full story, not giving the full picture because I had a very hard time talking about different experiences in my life. So that was one of it. One of the pieces is not being honest, not being forthcoming, but then also me not doing the work not being willing to make the changes. I, you know, have this mentality almost where I had, I feel like I had nothing would work. I kind of had this outlook that no matter what I did or whatever happened, nothing would ever get better. I kind of found myself in this box for a while and it was defeating that belief system and doing that again was getting around people who had done it and seeing what was working and giving myself that hope. So really what's worked for me in my treatment, my treatment journey so far is finding a therapist that works for me and being open, being honest, not being afraid to say the things that are on my mind and on my heart that are really, really holding me back, no matter what it looks like, no matter what it is. And also, again, a big part of that too, was changing my lifestyle. I, I said, I'm done with the parting. I'm done with the going out. And this is prior to me meeting my husband. I was like, I'm done just going out with random guys, with random people, you know, just, you know, having meaningless sex and thinking that that was going to help me. Cause that was a big, for me, I thought that was a coping mechanism. I said for me to, to get that uh, memory out of my head of what had happened to me with the sexual trauma, I thought the solution was going out and I'm in control. I can sleep around, do these things. Maybe that'll, and I thought I, I, I had to earn love. I was told that by many people I was with that I had to, that's what I thought. And that's what I believed. It was defeating those belief systems. It was being honest and open in therapy. And my advice for someone newly diagnosed, navigating this also, and also finding the medication that works for you or whatever that looks like, right? Whatever ever that treatment model is, I would say to not give up on that process because it's going to be hard. You're going to be overwhelmed. It's going to be difficult. 
And I know even, even for me, there's many moments ahead that I haven't even come across, right? Like for me, one day in the future, starting a family, I'm going to have to take into account different things that I, that I do differently than I do now. So it's letting that person know that there are so many people out there like me, like Kevin, who have navigated this and have gone through the ugliest parts of it. And we're still going to have those ugly parts resurface, but it's really finding that those core things, that support system, whether it's that, that therapist that works for you, whether it's that medication uh, regimen that works for you, your sleep, your habits, looking at the things you can control, making a list of that and starting with that and not overwhelming yourself for feeling like you don't have it all figured out. Because even me right now, I still don't. I still have days where I feel lost. I feel hopeless, but it's conversations like this that help me restore that and see that sometimes my, my brain lies to me. Yeah. It's incredible conversations like this that give people who are listening, viewing, watching, subscribing, the hope to move forward in their lives. And I think it's really important to note. Um, we're two shining examples of people that are still going through it, but we're working through it and we'll always work through it. And the dangers of suicidal ideation aren't going to take us. The The struggles of the, of the symptoms we have aren't going to break, break us down. They're only going to help us understand that we have to treat them affect them and build over time to get back to a, a fighting place uh, and a place of safety and hope and healing and recovery. Um, and that's the other thing I think you mentioned is really important. They say in the business world, if you want to be like, if you want to achieve a certain degree in business, certain success in business, follow the person who's done it before you 10 times over and follow that blueprint. Uh, uh, I think that this is very similar to someone who has, succeeded with a, a a brain and mental health diagnosis is if they have succeeded, what was their blueprint to success? Yes, not everyone's blueprint for success is going to be the same, but what what were the actions, the base actions they took to change their life, to change their brain over time so they could live well bipolar? So <laughs> it's really, really clear there. Um, okay, you got involved and you're involved with NAMI, National Alliance for Mental Illness, who I love. Um, what kind of work do you do with them? Yeah. So I actually found, so for, I really got involved with doing a lot more work with them right when the pandemic started actually. So I remember I started helping them out with, they have incredible resources for family members, um, individuals living with different mental illnesses. And they had these classes that were virtual that are now, um, more back to in-person, still virtual, um, family to family classes. And they had this, um, in our own voices presentation, ending the silence presentation where you can go out to different schools and talk about your, tell your story and, you know, really answer those questions for kids and see, you know, what, what they're navigating and just be help in that way. So I really got involved with them. And I remember I, I did some, some work with the podcast for them to help bring in some more people to share their stories. Cause they were looking for some more speakers, um, out here and just really being able to, again, like see an organization that is continuously putting out resources and content for helping family members. And if they don't have the answer, they do a great job of trying to direct people to other organizations or other uh, places that may be a fit for something that de they're dealing with or navigating. And something that I, th that's really helped me is just the, the aspect of storytelling. I feel like is being able to see whether it's, it's people in the audience who come up to me and, and tell me their own stories and their own experiences. And it's just, again, like, like you talk about this ripple effect, right. Of start, it starts with one, it starts with you and you tell your story and now someone else is telling theirs. And it happened to me. I remember even uh, a couple of weeks ago, I went to um, a, an organization, uh, uh, an event that NAMI put on. And one of the girls who was there, she was, she, she ended up telling me the, the woman who helps organize the event. She said, Hey, we have someone who's here. Who's going to be starting to tell her story for the first time. And she was like, she actually, we, she, she met us because she was at an event that you were at speaking. And then that's how this whole thing started. And I remember talking to her after, and I was like, wow, like, I wish I had you when I was your age, like you're so young. And it's just such a beautiful thing to see someone who's, you know, 17 years old, you know, about to be 18 and wanting to tell their story and 
share their experiences. And I'm like, I was not like that at that, <laughs> at that yeah. age. And I said, this is incredible. And I said, it's all because, and not necessarily, you know, you know, I think maybe I played a role in that, you know, her seeing me share my experiences, but that's what it was for me is me seeing other people share their experiences is what got me to share mine. So I want to just continue to, to share, to, to do that with, with, the work I do with NAMI, but then also with the podcast is opening up that stage for other people who have experiences living with bipolar, or you do work in the field with people who have a diagnosis. I want to hear from you. And that's really what I like to do is, is share more resources, share more of what works. And that's really what NAMI has, has helped me see. And it's been an incredible resource. And I know it's just, it's been an amazing blessing to my life and the lives of so many. Oh, boom. So, so good. <laughs> so, so I, uh, for those of you listening and not viewing, that was a, a mind blown situation. Um, so, so Paris, you know, uh, I really think you're, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head with everything you're saying. You're letting us know that when we show other people, we can do it. They sit there, they sit back and they go, I can do it. If Paris can do it, I can do it. If Kevin can do it, I can do it. Um, since you publicly shared your story living with bipolar, what has been something that has happened that you didn't see coming as a result of sharing? Yeah. So something I did not see coming as a result of sharing is, is literally what you just said, where people say, <clears throat> because Paris can do it, I can do it. I did not expect that at all. I don't know why I, you know, I didn't think that people would be sending emails, text messages or DMs or whatever it is you know, sharing this and saying, wow, like whether it's an episode or your book, or, you know, I saw this talk you did with NAMI, it's, it's really blown my mind because I mean, my whole thing in starting this was, I want to remove that fear that's living inside of me and telling me that you cannot share your story. It's not going to help. It's going to do more damage than good. I wanted to quiet that voice and I wanted to share these resources of other people's stories. So I did not expect so many people to be impacted through this. I really was like, I just want to do this to, to get rid of this once and for all for myself, but I want to do it to show more of what's actually making a difference because I know a little bit about it and I can share my story all day, but I want to open the stage up to others as well. So I really didn't expect that. And I didn't expect so many relationships to blossom that I've, that I've, that are such core values of my support system through this, because if I never started this, if I never shared my story, if I never started the podcast, if I never published my book, I would have never had the support system I have today. I would have never been blessed to have connected with you, to connect it with Brandy, to connect it with all of these people that we, that we know that are in our network who, you know, have shared their stories with us. And I feel like it's something that keeps me going on a daily basis on those days where I do still feel so overpowered with like I, I get those emotions coming up that it's the hopelessness and, you know, not wanting to continue doing what I'm doing and just yeah. really just having that, that negative funk. But I didn't expect so many people to be impacted the way that they have and to see that they're saying, you know, you're my hero, you're changing my life, you're helping my daughter, you're helping my son. And, and to, and to have these people who've, who've meant so much to me and, you know, especially being able to continue this, this work. I really didn't expect this. I just was like, I'm going to start it. I'm going to tell my story. I'm going to have other, you know, bring it on for other people. Hopefully it helps some people, but I, I really didn't think it would, it would turn into, to what it is. So I feel like it's been such a blessing to, to me and to so many that I didn't think it would be. Incredible. Shout out Brandy Benson, by the way. Yes. Brandy. Yes. Yes. And, and, uh, can you share a moment, a memorable realization in your journey that significantly shaped your approach to brain and mental health? Yes. Yeah, so one of those events is me, uh, my husband. So we got married. It's almost a year. So we're going to be coming oh. up on our one, one year wedding anniversary. We've been together five years now. So for me, cause that, that was the biggest thing I struggled with. I was like, I'm truly never going to be able to have a successful relationship. And I kept going back to a lot of the, I thought it was something inherently wrong with me because mm. of bipolar. That's really what I thought. And it was, for me, it was being around him and telling him my story and feeling so safe and so supported. 
And also, you know, having someone, but also it goes back to me too, starting the work. So previously to me meeting him, that was when I first got into seriously, I'm going to make these changes because if I hadn't done that, it would not have worked because there's only so much someone can do for someone if they're not willing to continue to put in the effort. So he's helped me a lot with seeing my patterns that were destructive and damaging that I've learned from that. I kind of took on from these relationships where I thought that I had to earn love that I thought that I wasn't enough as a person. And I've been in pretty, you know, pretty damaging, um, situations and, you know, it, it, I've taken advantage of, in terms of, you know, from a young age, getting into going through the sexual assault and, you know, how, like, getting into sex work and different things like that, that I, cause I really, when you don't value yourself as a person, it really shoots down any sense of hope that you have for moving forward. So really meeting Dan and being able to have someone who sees value in my story, sees value in my life. He supported me because I met him before, before the podcast, before I was ever public with my story, before I even started writing my book, I met him and I was scared. And I said, I'm going to tell you this. And I thought in my head, I'm like, okay, He's never going to want to talk to me again. And I, I was like happy. I was like, that's a good thing. Cause he's such a good person. And once he knows this, he's going to not be with me and find you know someone else. But he literally thanked me. And he said, I want to, you know, thank you for sharing this with me. It helps me understand so much about, about you. And, you know, we're getting to know each other and we're dating and he was so respectful and so just so interested in me and wanted to get to know about my life, my passions, my interests. And he just helps me, you know, we, I really feel like he helped me learn how to communicate my mm. pain points. And that was the, one of the biggest blessings for me in my, in my, my time here navigating bipolar disorder is having a partner who I feel like I can finally build a life with and, you know, have this, have things that I never thought would be possible. Like being able to have a beautiful home together, being able to make incredible memories and travel and have our families come together and, you know, just, just be able to see that it works because I really thought that it, it wasn't possible. He didn't judge you for your past. He looked at you by the character of your person that you are today and that you were working towards being for the rest of your life, which is incredible. What an amazing guy. Um, <laughs> Paris, final question. Look in the camera. And, and, and talk to the microphone for those who are listening and talk to the young girl who has just been diagnosed with bipolar depression and she is struggling. She doesn't yet know what it means. She might be terrified. What do you say to her? Yeah. So I would say to her, I would tell her that everything that you've ever told yourself you could never have or never be or never do was never real. And you will make it out of this, this hospital, you will make it out of these scenarios where you've been in so much pain, whether it's emotional, physical, from relationships, friendships, family, things that have really damaged you. And your, your life won't be taken and ended because of by your own hands. And you won't have you'll be able to get, get in all these things that you told yourself you wouldn't have. You'll have a fulfilling relationship. You'll feel so supported. You'll be able to have healed relationships that you thought you would never be able to have in your life. You'll be able to move forward and really make this life something that you, you told yourself you would never have. And all the pain that you're feeling right now, all the overwhelm, all the stress, you will be able to take back control of so many of these moments that you tell yourself you need to stay in. You don't need to stay there anymore. You're not going to have to continue living in these environments. You are able to take yourself out of it and really share your story. And another thing that I want to tell, tell you is your story is going to change lives and leave an impact on so many who have been searching for what you have inside of you that you told yourself to never share. And that evil voice in you that tells you not to share, to be silent, to continue hurting yourself and that you aren't beautiful, you aren't deserving that voice is not real. And that voice is going to be silenced by the overwhelming love that you will experience from so many of the relationships that you will come to know in your life and the support network that you will build and foster and all that you will do with your story. You, you are meant to be here. Your life has value. You have purpose and 
it's only going to get up from go up from here and you'll still have down days. You'll still have those bad moments, but you know what to do and you know how to navigate it. So I want you to know that I'm proud of you. I love you. And you have always been enough. You've always been enough. You're, you're a thousand times greater than the worst experience you've ever had. You're beautiful just as you are. And you're meant to be here until your natural end. Friends, family, colleagues, this has been the Hindsights Podcast, an incredible episode with the amazing Paris Scobie. Paris, thank you for your time. Be well, everyone, and be here tomorrow. See ya.